I mean, every type of photography has its role in how it disseminates information, how it informs, you know, how it documents history and so forth. Um, I think I'm one of the rare photographers where I exist between these two worlds because I am still a photojournalist and I am also an artist. And existing between these two points, uh, one inspires the other, uh, one answers to the other. And what I believe in is that we are in probably the most visual uh, stage of our history. So the fact that we have social media, which is heavily visually based, um, and as we know, the power of the image has really uh, pushed many things forward. And this is what we have to, as visual storytellers, we have to continue um, documenting not only these realities, but also um, really constructing a conversation and a dialogue about what we experience and what we see. And that, I believe, is a tool of photography. And photography is a communication tool because for anyone listening to this on a daily, just think about the amount of, amount of images that you consume. Uh, and imagine the amount of images that you consume and how that has an impact on your day or your thoughts about a space or your, your thoughts about purchasing something or your thoughts about you know, uh, and news that you didn't know about. All of these are provoked uh, much more intensely, I think, through the image than words. I believe the world is bombarded with a lot of images relating to war, famine, um, all these different uh, social issues that come up. And for me, the ultimate goal is, uh, since we see a lot of the same images over and over again, it was really trying to express the same message, but do it in a way that uh, will attract an audience to actually look into the image instead of just passing it by. So in a sense, it's really to uh, provoke curiosity. I think that's what it's done. Um, but ultimately, it's also sort of a window into like a much bigger story, you know, to, to get people interested into actually digging for that information and providing them with information that they might be unaware of, but through an artistic form. I work with um, primary colors for a specific reason because I feel that uh, this has a lot to do with how I see myself as an artist. I, I, I still consider myself to be at the infancy of this and by using primary colors, these are the colors that I'm trying to explore to the fullest before I move into other, other colors and other shades. That's the one factor. The second factor, I think, over the years, I realized that a lot of the primary colors were something that I was pulling from uh, Ethiopian church paintings, which, uh, you know, I grew up with it, but somehow it subconsciously existed in my mind, and then it's also come out in the work. And in that sense, uh, what you see in any of my work that I've created, it's really to try to attract with the colors, but there's more than just a painted face and there's more than just colored material and so forth. So in that sense, um, my choice of you know, using specific patterns, uh, the work is for me uh, something that I think anyone can connect to because it, it has the simplicity, but it's also complex within it. And I think that's the true form of art that you're able to penetrate uh, an audience regardless of class, um, you know, ethnicity, geographical locations. So my ultimate goal at the end of the day is, for example, you know, I want my family who are farmers uh, in the middle of Wadlo uh, to see the work and recognize it, and they recognize it. So I don't try to over-intellectualize my work. I do want my work to resonate regardless of who you are, where you come from. And I think for me, the most rewarding is sort of to, to hear not the comments of art critics or curators or what have you, but to really listen to how children relate to the work when they see it. And it's quite fascinating uh, to experience that as an artist. The colors and the forms are just me seducing you, you know, to bring you into the image. This is, it's a seduction, you know. But uh, behind that curtain, there's a lot of things within it. and. Even for my collectors, when, when they have the piece in their homes, you know, they see different things each day. You know, there's different things that unravel within it. And I do believe uh, you know, that's also life. You know, you, nothing remains the same. Nothing's ever stagnant. You know, things are continuously unfolding. And that's my ultimate goal for my work, is that when you look at it, you find new things. Uh, you find new emotions. 
and also the uh, you know the stairs are quite intense as well so so it's it's I can talk about each piece for a very long time um, because it's something that is very it's not a passive creation for me it's something that's very deeply rooted within who I am and also the things that I want to say Uh, this Syria piece called The Silence of Hope is, was actually photographed in Grand Bassam, which is uh, a small beach town uh, about 40 minutes outside of the city of Abidjan in Côte d'Ivoire. The space that I decided to use it in is an abandoned uh, hotel, which was actually the first hotel in Côte d'Ivoire called Hotel de France. And what you see uh, on the wall is we decided to actually paint the background uh, on the actual wall to give it that texture and feel. I thought it was quite fascinating that in the midst of destruction, the artists are trying, the artists are trying to find a moment of beauty, not just for themselves for expressing it, but also to the people, sort of to prevail through these challenging times is how I understood it. Um, so that was the background that I chose, which was inspired by someone in Syria. And then I had seen a photo of a little girl uh, selling bread in the midst of rubble and I thought you know wow that's pretty intense and you know this photo um, of the girl selling the bread I, I, in my imagination was like because I have kids I was thinking okay imagine sending my kid to go and sell bread to earn some kind of income and for that kid to sit at the table and to really look at what surrounds her I believe that that must have some kind of an impact on the psyche or, you know, sort of the spirit. So from that, I said, okay, well, we're going to, I would like to do sort of a, a table setting, which obviously is symbolic of, you know, a meal or a supper. And to me, the questions that I had was, how are people really living in Syria? You know, how are they, you know, not only trying to find food daily, but how, how are they also dealing with their loved ones being killed or you know, uh, the men out to war, or their sons out to war. And this is really what I was trying to evoke uh, in this piece uh, and really to symbolize not just the relationship of food and war, but really also about the human spirit and also the sadness that comes along with that and the trauma that not only the adults are a victim of, but also the future generation that will have this embedded in their uh, mental state as well.